so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode is about real life events. It contains adult themes and language, so if you have little ears around, be warned. It's May 9, 2001, and the family of missing teenager Natasha Ryan are holding a memorial service in Bundaberg, Queensland. Today would have been her 17th birthday. Natasha, with dark brown hair, hazel eyes and fair, freckled skin, had disappeared on August 31, 1998. She was 14 years old. For almost three years, there has been no trace of her. Her father, Robert Ryan, and mother, Jenny Ryan, have accepted that their daughter is dead. They may never find her remains. But at this memorial, they say their final goodbyes. Their pain is palpable to everyone around them. But, as they will later learn, Natasha Ryan is still alive. She's about 25 minutes away. And in a story unlike anything seen anywhere in the world, Natasha will appear at her own murder trial two years later. Her story is one Australia won't ever forget. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Paula Donovan and Tara Brown. Paula is a Walkley Award-winning journalist who's currently the crime editor at ABC News in Brisbane, and Tara is a reporter for 60 Minutes, who, in 2003, interviewed Natasha Ryan after she came out of hiding. It was the 31st of August 1998 when 14-year-old Natasha Ryan was dropped at school. What can you tell us about the day that she disappeared? Just the basics, that her mum dropped her at school. Mum thought that she'd gone in. She never made it to roll call. She didn't actually go into class. And she then went to a pre-arranged spot, a, a local cinema, to meet with Scott Black, her boyfriend at the time, and then they kind of disappeared into the day. But for mum, Jenny, when Natasha, you know, didn't show up after school, that caused great concern and she contacted the police to report Natasha missing. And the police response was initially one of constraint, a conservative response because Natasha had run away before but had gone for a day or something like that. And so the advice from police was wait 48 hours and then we'll we'll look into this a little more thoroughly, at which point mum rang again and they did. Do we know much about Natasha's home life? Because you say that she had disappeared before for a short period. What was her home life like and her relationship with her parents? As a 14-year-old, Natasha was a fairly troubled teenager from all reports, from both her mum and herself when I spoke to them. Natasha was having troubles at school. She was having troubles at home. Her parents had divorced. She claims that that had been quite overwhelming for her. But she was also in a relationship with an older boyfriend. She was 14 at the time. Scott Black was 22. And that was causing conflict. She was also dabbling, experimenting with drugs at school. She'd been self-harming. She was in counselling. So she was a girl with, you know, a lot on her shoulders at that time. And I think You know, there was quite a lot of conflict. Natasha describes it as a world that she didn't really want to be in anymore. She didn't want to be at school. She didn't want to be at home. She didn't want to be in that life. So it wasn't a pleasant time for her. Do you know much about Scott Black, the man that Natasha essentially ran away with and stayed with over that period? Look, I I don't know a lot about him other than that he worked locally as a milkman. He grew up in the area. He came to know Natasha through his on-off relationships with her older sister, Donna. He was someone that, you know, he started seeing Natasha 
while he was still in a relationship with Guy for a second time, a second or third time, I think it was, in 1998. He was also someone that Natasha sought out. So in a lead up to her disappearance in September 98, she actually ran away from home and she was found with him. So I think it was July that year, 98, that, you know, Scott had hidden her in a local motel. He booked her in under the guise of her being his sister. So there's not actually really a lot known about Scott Black. He's a bit of an enigma, really, but someone mm. obviously who was also very capable of hiding her from the world. And she, according to her parents, disappeared. Were there any witnesses who saw her that day? Where did the police start in terms of trying to locate her? From my understanding, there were witnesses that spotted her around the movie cinema, which is the location that she and Scott had organised for her to be picked up from. And interestingly, people claimed that they had seen her in the presence of Leonard Fraser, who was later convicted of serial rape. He was known locally as the Rockhampton Rapist. And so people claimed that they had seen her in his presence at that location. But that seems to be the last sighting of her. And it would be proven later that the witnesses were wrong, that she was not in the presence of Leonard Fraser, but that she had been at that spot and that whoever they saw her with, it wasn't Leonard Fraser at that point in time. And the police would have interviewed Scott Black, I imagine. He's the partner and you have someone who's gone missing. What did he say? Was he cooperative with police? No, he lied. (laughs) No, he lied. And he was later convicted of perjury for that. But no, he claimed he didn't know anything about Natasha's whereabouts and perhaps was quite convincing to the police at that time. But in fact, he and Natasha were living 45 minutes away in Yapoon and then closer to Natasha's revival, if you like, five minutes from her mother's place back in Rockhampton. So he obviously was very aware of where she was but was protecting her and possibly himself. And what was the police search like? So you've got this is 1998 and it went on for years in terms of them not knowing where she is. Was this front page news? Like what was the scale of this search? The scale of the search ended up being massive, you know, from a conservative response from police where, well, let's see, this girl's run away before to 48 hours later, yes. Uh, The overlay of it, of course, was that there were a number of other girls and women who had gone missing during this time. And so, There was this massive hunt and the local volunteers, like over 100 local volunteers from the SES who conducted searches for Natasha, bushland was burnt trying to find her body. There was an absolute motivation and effort by the local community to find a girl that they thought was a victim of a serial killer. What did her parents think had happened? As the years wore on, did they become convinced that their daughter had died? Oh, yes. I think from quite an early stage of her disappearance. I think because she had troubles, she'd run away before, but it always come back. I think the fact that she didn't, there was no word from her. There was obviously no sightings of her, apart from that initial sighting on the day that she disappeared. And then you have the overlay, as I said, of other women going missing. I don't think they had any hope of ever seeing her again. I mean, they held a memorial service for her on what would have been her 17th birthday, friends, you know, releasing balloons into the sky. They'd had the saddest of farewells. They thought she was dead. Eventually, Leonard Fraser was actually tried for her murder, wasn't he? Well, he pleaded guilty to murdering her. He was on trial for a number of other women and a nine-year-old girl who'd gone missing. And he was later convicted over those disappearances for rape and murder. But he pleaded guilty to the murder of Natasha. And it's believed that was to get himself a better deal in jail, that he would be protected from the general jail community. So he pleaded guilty to Natasha's murder. Natasha heard about the fact that he was on trial and that she was meant to be one of his victims. And that concerned her enough to contact Kids Helpline. So she made an anonymous call to Kids Helpline to say that she was alive and that she was not a murder victim. Was there any evidence that he was responsible? 
There was a lot of evidence in relation to Fraser committing Natasha Lyons' murder, and you also have to put it back into the context that you were dealing with a predator who, prior to him starting his killing spree in Rockhampton, he had already convictions in Queensland and New South Wales for rape and abuse of females. So by the time police were looking at Natasha as a potential victim for Fraser, she actually fitted the profile and if it had been the case, would have been the first to go missing. She fitted the victim profile in terms of her, Julie Turner and Beverly Lego all disappeared within three months of each other Mm. uh, within a 200 metre radius of each other where they were all last seen within the Rockhampton inner city area. They were also all vulnerable by circumstance. So Julie Turner and Beverly Lego were vulnerable by drug and alcohol affliction as well as unstable relationships. And Natasha was vulnerable by her being a teenage runaway. She had a turbulent family life and was having a lot of difficulties at school in the lead up. So by the time the police had come to charging Fraser, they had based their case on a number of things. One was there was no proof of life. So they had done everything from hospital checks, bank account checks. She hadn't reached out to any welfare agency support friends uh, or anything since she was reported missing in September 1998. They also had a statement from at least one friend that put her together with Fraser that she had bumped into them on the street and when Natasha sort of asked Fraser to leave her and a friend alone for a bit, she confided in that friend that Fraser had been pressuring her and the inference that he was pressuring her for sex. They also had information from Natasha's mother, Jenny, who worked at a Rockhampton bowling alley where Natasha also went to on a Friday night to compete and socialise. Fraser was also there with his girlfriend, Chrissy Wright, who attended the bowling alley with the Endeavour Foundation. So they potentially had also crossed paths there. Jenny had also picked Fraser out off a photo board during the investigation into Fraser's murder and rape of Kira Steinhardt, which is the case that obviously exposed him as a serial killer. Mm. And there was also three items of jewellery found in the possession of Chrissy Wright, Fraser's girlfriend, that Jenny Ryan identified as belonging to her daughter. And that was a bracelet, a necklace, and a silver dolphin ring. As well as that, there was also the jailhouse confessions between Fraser and Alan Quinn. And in those jailhouse confessions, there was a strategy with the police and the prosecution being Crown Prosecutor Paul Rutledge not to rely solely on jailhouse confessions because we all know that they cannot always be reliable. So they basically gathered evidence that things that only the killer would know. And that included Fraser knowing that Natasha was pregnant. Fraser had given information about how he had killed Natasha in an abandoned house on a sort of a property just outside of Rockhampton. And I guess in the context of those confessions, when Fraser had spoken to Alan Quinn, those confessions to Alan Quinn for the other victims had proved fruitful for police in leading them to the victim's remains and other evidence that led towards convicting Fraser. You mentioned that Leonard Fraser said she was pregnant when she disappeared. Was that true? Oh, look, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether she was or not. There was certainly no medical record to support that, and obviously there was no child to support that that anyone knows of. But, look, she confided in her school counsellor and uh, the school chaplain. She'd made a lot of statements in the lead-up. She'd confided in a couple of friends. It wasn't public knowledge, which is another reason why they thought Fraser, you know, may have killed her because Fraser had at one stage claimed that he got angry with her because she said that she was pregnant to him. But there's nothing out there to support that other than that there was a teenage girl making those claims in a very difficult time in the lead-up to her disappearing and Natasha herself denied being pregnant, denied saying it and in a subsequent summary trial against her and Black for creating a false police investigation, she again denied ever saying it to anybody despite there being copious notes from her school counsellor and the school chaplain basically that that is in fact what she had claimed. That's some pretty compelling evidence. You would think if someone is on trial then that's a pretty incredible case against someone. How did the court 
discover that Leonard Fraser couldn't possibly be responsible for the murder of Natasha? On the 11th day of the trial, so Paul Rutledge, the prosecutor, basically rose to his feet and dropped a big bombshell that Natasha Ryan had been found alive, that she'd been discovered basically hiding in a cupboard in the home of her boyfriend, Scott Black. So basically two days before, the Rockhampton detectives had received an anonymous letter that Natasha was alive and that basically led to the discovery. So Paul Rutledge was... You know, you're always a bit dubious about whether someone is actually, I mean, we're talking about a murder victim that basically has come back from the dead during, during the murder trial of the man accused of killing her. So Paul had asked if her father, Robert Ryan, to basically do a voice identification over the phone to ensure that it was, in fact, Natasha, who police had found. But Paul was also very conscious of telling Robert about that because only the day before he had sat Robert Ryan down and gone through great detail of Fraser's confession of how he had murdered Natasha. Mm. So when Paul Rutledge asked uh, Rob to identify him, first of all, you can imagine Robert Ryan's response. He was absolutely shocked. And I think he actually said something like, don't carry on with this crap. You know, I don't kind of believe you and... Paul Rutledge handed him the phone and Rob asked Natasha a question and he said, if you're my daughter, you'll know a nickname that only you and I know that I gave you. And she said, Dad, this is your grasshopper. And that's how they basically knew that she hadn't been murdered, that she was in fact alive. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with journalists Paula Donovan and Tara Brown about the disappearance of Natasha Ryan. What do we know about the day she was found when police walked into that house? What did they find? Well, I think it was the 10th of April 2003 and Again, the police had got a tip-off, an anonymous tip-off, that Natasha was alive and well and that she could be found at this address, which was now back in Rockhampton, five minutes from her mum's house. And they did a raid on the house and they found Natasha hiding in a cupboard in the main bedroom. There were reports at the time that Natasha Ryan had almost spent most of that time in that cupboard. That wasn't accurate, was it? No, not from what she told me. I mean, she spent almost all her time in the house, concealed from neighbours and delivery people and friends and Scott would have friends over and she would go and hide in their bedroom, but she did not spend nearly five years in the cupboard. (laughs) But it was her hiding place the day the police raided. What was their relationship like with what she told you about them? Did it appear that it was very much her choice to go into hiding? It was certainly a question I asked her because at the time, as we know, Natasha was 14 and quite troubled and Scott was 22. So, you know, there was definitely a child-adult relationship there in terms of I guess, maturity and power and so forth. So Natasha was adamant when I asked her about that, whether it was her choice, and she was definite that it was her choice, that she wanted to be there. It was not a prison. It was her home with Scott and that she was a willing participant. What ended up happening with Leonard Fraser? Because she actually appeared incredibly at her own murder trial. What happened there? Yes, I think it was something like 20 days after she reappeared in Rockhampton that she was then at, as you say, her own murder trial. And, you know, clearly he had not killed her and clearly he'd made up that story. He claims since then for notoriety, as any psychopath might do. But I think, as I said, the belief was that he was trying to get a better deal for himself. Mm. I think it was probably a sweet moment for the defence when the day after Natasha was found alive, 
Linda Fraser's lawyer was able to stand up in court and say he's not guilty of murder because she's just been found alive, which is very shocking news for mm. family and, and the people of Rockhampton. So, yes, he went on to be convicted of the other murders. He led police to his victims' burial sites and, you know, those convictions were sound. You can wonder perhaps if he hadn't done that whether, you know, Natasha's role in this might have jeopardised that court case, but he had, in fact, shown police where he buried his victims. So he was convicted and sentenced, I think, to three consecutive lifetimes and ended up dying in jail of a heart attack. Do you think that if Natasha had never come forward, if she had remained hidden and if the police hadn't located her, then Leonard Fraser would have gone to jail for her murder? Uh, Look, potentially, yes, you know, because her case was part of a building block and there was certainly enough evidence for a magistrate to commit that case to the Supreme Court as part of a multiple murder trial. It fit into a timeline. She fit the victim profile. Mm. Uh, He had information that no one else knew that wasn't public. There was his confession as well. Yes, I think very much so that it could happen. I think that's probably one of the reasons why Natasha came forward in the end, you know, that she started making contact with the next boyfriend. So do you think that she wanted to be found? Was that sort of what happened at the end? Because the police obviously had a tip-off. Was that from the ex-boyfriend? Well, the ex-boyfriend confided in his boss and I think it was his boss that ended Mm. up... You know, he contacted a solicitor and then he ends up contacting the police himself by leaving an anonymous note that had a home phone number on it, which is obviously the one that led them to actually Scott Black's house. But I think for Natasha, in a limited information that she kind of talked about her time while she was in hiding, she talked about the lie becoming too big. And I think once she saw that Fraser was on trial, I think that was part of what motivated her to come forward. The question I came to is, is what they both did criminal? So what Scott Black did, I mean, he lied to police and he hid someone. Is that criminal? And was he charged and convicted for that? So he was convicted of perjury for lying to police and he was sentenced to three years jail. He served a year And then he and Natasha were both fined for what led to a false police investigation. And Natasha was fined $1,000, but I think the judge deemed that she was incapable of paying. She didn't have the means to pay. And Scott was fined $16,000. Not having the means to pay was an interesting point of tension at the time because what happened when Natasha Ryan was found is that there was a media storm. This was international news and she appeared on 60 Minutes and in a magazine where there was a pretty incredible interview as well. What's the ethics around being paid to do those sorts of media appearances when there had been so many resources and so much money put into trying to find her for such a long period of time? Yes, I mean... (laughs) Well, it's a hard question to answer and, and I think we're actually in very different times now. There was such a huge media storm around that story and, you know, whether you believe in checkbook journalism as it's deemed or not, the only way those interviews were secured was through payment. And, you know, I guess the ethical question can also be asked of Natasha Ryan and Scott Black in terms of their payback to a community. The search was something like, Four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars looking for her. You know, it's always a difficult one. No one that I know in the business likes to pay for a story. You just don't, but it does happen sometimes, not as often mm. as it used to, thankfully. But it was a crazy time. I, you know, I remember being in Rockhampton and because we had secured the story, we also became part of the story, which is also something you don't really ever want to be. You know, we were chased down the street and Photographers were everywhere, and other news crews were everywhere. It was an extraordinary story because, you know, it was just so unbelievable that this girl had disappeared for so long and was so close to home and all that, you know, the whys and the wherefores, the pain and for her family and the inability to really explain it fully made it a very fascinating tale. 
So many people find it hard that you would put your family through so much pain, that if you really loved them, that you could never do this to them. How could you do this to them? I honestly don't know. I can't. It would have been one of the most sought after television interviews in the world at that time. And you sat down with Natasha Ryan. I mean, where did you start? Where did you start with trying to understand the biggest question, I suppose, which was why? It was really confounding. It was difficult. She was also fairly new to her new situation. You know, she was now famous for all the wrong reasons and she was getting to know her family again. And I think she was quite overwhelmed at the stage that I sat down opposite her. And the biggest question of all why, I think it was really difficult for her to explain because now she's an 18-year-old trying to explain the decisions she made as a 14-year-old. And how do you do that? <laughs> you know, it's really, you know, I look back on my own life and go, well, I don't know that I can ever give you the full details of why I made that decision in that moment. I mean, she could speak about the pain that she'd caused her family and she was clearly upset. But it just seemed, I think, for her, for her family, probably for people even who saw the interview, that her answers seemed inadequate for the magnitude of what had happened. But you know, she was a kid. She was a troubled kid. She didn't run away understanding how severe and significant those consequences would be. She didn't know that there'd be a serial killer who was on trial for her murder. The other stuff you'd think she might guess at, the pain that she'd caused her family, that she was really cutting ties. I mean, she was disappearing forever in that moment. I just don't know that she understood fully the depth of that at that time. And then I think When she was in the situation, she just didn't know how to get out of it. And she was protecting Scott. You know, she was in love with him and, you know, she knew that he would be in trouble too, I'd imagine. And so I just don't know that she knew how to get out of it. Her parents, how did she go about repairing that relationship? How were her parents, her mum and dad, when they found out she was alive? Well, I only spoke to her mum, Jenny, and she says in her interview to me that she hated her. She didn't want to see Natasha to begin with. And then she saw her. And of course, she wanted to hug her and never let her go. I mean, you know, she was so angry and so hurt, but so desperate and so happy, I guess, to have her back. I don't know that it was all smooth sailing from then on, but I think she was so grateful to have her daughter back. Probably could forgive but never forget. What has Natasha done that's hurt you the most? That hurt me the most would be running away that day. Like last time I seen Natasha prior to this, I dropped her off at school. She leant over. She gave me a kiss and said, I love you. You know, however, if a person loved you so much, how could they put you through that much pain? And how about Natasha's relationship with Scott Black? So he went to jail for a year. What happened when he came back? My understanding is that they continued their relationship and they married and they have children and they're together. When you look back at that time, you said it was such a different time, which is very true. I mean, we're looking at nearly 20 years. Do you think that this case would have been dealt with differently if it were now? I mean, still, it's an incredible story that someone is found and you can understand the media circus that ensued, but do you think we'd have a different reading of it today? I don't know because it was such a unique story at that time and I think it would still be such a unique story at this time and I think that we would be desperate to tell it. I just... Well, you couldn't do it on Zoom, could you? Which has been our experience for (laughs) the past 12 months at least. Yeah, it's hard to know how we would all respond, but I think a story is a story and this was an amazing story. Looking back at that interview, I thought you had an incredible amount of empathy and to toe that line between the empathy of a teenage girl who made a decision she didn't understand the gravity of and also a teenage girl who 
the resources, the police work, the pain, the suffering of everyone who looked for her. I mean, it was two stories, really. And I wonder how we would read it in terms of the empathy now. I mean, when you interviewed her, was there an element of feeling really sorry for her that this girl was so out of her depth? Or did you also have to carry the responsibility of going, no, there's a lot you have to answer for? Well, that's right. I did feel that there was a real anger in that community and justifiably so for those people who looked for her. But I did feel sorry for her. I felt that this was such a huge mess that, you know, the more she understood, the harder it was for her to get out of because of all that money, because of all that effort, because of all that heartache. So, yes, it was a difficult one because I did feel for her. I felt very sorry for her, but I also knew that people were pretty angry and you're always questioning, okay, does sympathy and pity mean that you don't get somebody to justify their really bad decisions Mm. and their bad actions? So others are to judge whether we walk that line properly, but she was clearly upset. She found it difficult to articulate what she had been feeling and her decision-making as a teenage girl. I can't imagine that pressure. There would be people all over the country that are demanding you ask a specific question. And I think it was, as you say, it was a story that was stranger than fiction. And still 20 years on, it is baffling, but fascinating to think about the motives of someone at the centre of it. It's a fascinating story. It is a fascinating story. And, you know, I don't want to dismiss how much angst it caused in that community. And nor do I know the ins and outs of Natasha and Scott's relationship. I wouldn't even dare to presume. But if they are happy together, that makes me kind of happier too. You know, that for all the mess that ensued, that what they seemed to have was genuine and real and enduring and that at least there was something good to come out of something that at that time must have seemed really bad, Mm. a really bad decision. Tara Brown has been reporting for Channel 9's 60 Minutes program for 20 years. In 2003, she travelled to Rockhampton for an exclusive interview with Natasha and her family and saw firsthand where Natasha had been hiding during the five years she was believed to be missing. Paula Donovan has been working in newspapers and broadcast for almost three decades and is currently crime editor at ABC News in Brisbane. Paula spent seven years researching Queensland's first convicted serial killer, Leonard John Fraser. It was this research that led her to Natasha's story. She's detailed both of these cases in her book, Things a Killer Would Know, which you can find a link to in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens, and produced by Gia Moylan. If you liked this episode, then please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast app. Or if you have a case you think we should cover next, you can contact us via email at truecrime at mamamia.com.au. I'll be back next week with another episode, but in the meantime, if you'd like to hear more from me, you can hear me on Mamma Mia Out Loud three times a week, as well as Cancelled, a comedy podcast about the stories of celebrity cancellations.